Good morning, Southgate, and thank you for having me today. If we haven't met before, my name's Beth. I'm Carolyn and Sean Richardson's daughter, and Southgate was my church family when I was growing up. It was a great place to learn more about who Jesus is, which is what hopefully we'll be doing this morning. It's so wonderful to be with you, even if that's just over video. I'm streaming to you from wonderful Newcastle. We love living here, really close to the coast. Um, me and my husband Brogan. Brogan is training for ordination at Grandma Hall in Durham and I work for the Diocese of Newcastle. Today we're going to be exploring this passage from Matthew 2. If you're just exploring the Bible, this is your first time opening it up, this is a great place to start as this passage is all about who Jesus is. To others of you, this may seem a very familiar story. It's one that we hear every Christmas again and again of the wise men coming to visit the baby Jesus. So these wise men are some very early visitors, probably when um, Jesus was a toddler, uh, most likely from Iraq or Iran, who traveled following the sign of a star. They've come to worship him. Get this passage together this morning, we'll unpack a bit more who Jesus is is and how we can seek his presence and adore him together. So let's get into it. In verse 1, Matthew sets the scene after Jesus was born in Bethlehem. This is the very first story Matthew tells us about Jesus. It's the first thing he says about Jesus' birth. I wonder if someone was telling a story about your life, what would be the first thing that they would say? Who would they say you are. That opening phrase after Jesus' birth in Bethlehem is significant because Matthew doesn't really tell us that much about the birth of Jesus. Most of the details that we traditionally think of in our nativities that we see in our churches and our schools, those details come from the Gospel of Luke. Now both Matthew and Luke are witnessing to the same truth that God came down as man um, on earth to dwell with us, Emmanuel, and they both do talk about this Christmas story, but they do it in very different ways. The nativity, according to Matthew, would jump straight from the angel telling Joseph that Mary's pregnant and that he should call the child Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. It then jumps straight to the wise men. Matthew must have thought the wise men were pretty important if he skipped over details about the shepherds, etc. He must want us to pay attention to this story. I think the reason that Matthew focuses on the wise men's story is because it really points out something about Jesus' identity. Who is Jesus that these men would travel all this way to come worship him? Throughout the passage, we see that Jesus is called three different names through which Matthew is pointing to us, the reader, who Jesus is. The fact that Matthew describes Jesus in three different ways in this little passage corresponds to the three gifts that the wise men bring. These three different names describe who Jesus is and show us the character of God. This story reminds us, even if we've heard it countless times, of the identity of Jesus, the one whom we adore as King, Messiah and God with us. Today we're going to explore together what these three descriptions of Jesus mean and how we should respond to them today. The first one we can see in verse 2. Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. The wise men set out to adore the King of the Jews they are searching for the king of God's people. One of the reasons we know that the wise men travelled so far is that they call him king of the Jews. If they'd been Israelites, they would have called him king of Israel. So the, the wise men are probably not Jewish themselves. Um, they're probably from Persia, most likely Zoroastrians, which are a type of astronomer. Um, but they could have been exiled Jews who were sent to Persia centuries before. Either way, they're astronomers, they're very learned, they're very wise, they're very wealthy, and they know that when they've seen this star, 
his star, as they describe it in verse 2. This is a sign from God that the king of the Jews is born. Now, God's people have a very complicated relationship with kingship in the Bible. You see this throughout the Old Testament, that the Israelites again and again and again reject the authority of God. They turn away from him. And one of the ways that they seek their own way of doing things was they asked God for an earthly king, a ruler to rule over them like the nations around them had. And God adheres to their request. He does anoint a king. But then God anoints through King David. He says, I promise you, my people, that even when you turn away from me, the king of the Jews will come and he will redeem Israel. He will establish his throne forever. So we see these prophecies in 2 Samuel and Isaiah. If you want to look those up, please do. Um, and this is the king of the Jews that the wise men are referring to, this long promised king. The wise men's opening question, where is the king of the Jews, would have both political as well as the prophetic implications. Unfortunately, they're so accustomed to earthly princes and rulers that they head straight to a palace. But we know Jesus was born in a stable, head to Jerusalem, because they still don't really know who Jesus is and they're looking for answers. And so they go to Herod. They thought that the leaders of the Jews would not only know about the birth of Jesus, but that they would be elated, that would be so excited to meet him. But the Jewish leaders weren't excited at all to meet their long prophesied king. They knew where he was, but they, they didn't join the wise men in coming to find him. The bystanders in Herod's court could hardly help contrasting the hoped for king that had been talked about throughout the scriptures and their current king, who was given the title of king of the Jews by the Roman emperor. He's a puppet king for the Romans. And um, Herod wasn't even Jewish at all. He was an Edomite. So this pokes fun at Herod and contrasts his tyranny with the perfect kingship of Jesus. Significantly, the wise men say in verse two, look with me, they say, the one who has been born king of the Jews. It's a strange thing for a baby to be born a king. Usually they're born a prince or they become a duke of somewhere. But in the wise men's minds, Jesus is not the king of the Jews in some future time when Herod's gone. Jesus is king of the Jews now. And they've come to worship him without delay, even though they don't fully know who he is. They've come to Jerusalem to find out, as I'm sure you've come to church this morning to find out more about Jesus. The fact that the wise men thought they were just coming to worship an earthly king is also shown by their gift bringing. This is very common in Eastern culture at the time that you would bring a gift to royalty. And I mean, we still do this today. So um, I wonder if you've ever seen royalty. I was, I was trying to think back and I heard this podcast the other day, which said that one in three people in the UK have seen the Queen. And I was amazed by this, but then I guess the Queen, I mean, it's a testament to her work ethic, but I guess quite a lot of people see the Queen when she visits somewhere. And I remember her visiting Boris Edmonds in 2002 for her Golden Jubilee. My primary school class went and waved flags everywhere in the Abbey Gardens. And maybe you were there on Angel Hill and saw the Queen. Um, but one of the things I noticed from all the photographs as I started Googling it to have a look, there's loads of people giving the Queen flowers, just bunches and bunches of flowers. They're giving her gifts for her royal visit. They're honouring her. The gift of gold presented by the wise men, the symbol of royalty. It points towards Jesus' sovereignty and power as a mighty king. The wise men have come to worship him as a king, but they still haven't that much about Jesus yet in the passage when we see them call him this in verse 2. And they haven't met him yet. 
They did not realise that he was God. Maybe you're here today and you're interested in the person of Jesus, who Jesus is, but you wouldn't necessarily say you're a Christian or that you believe in Jesus as the Son of God. Well, I'd encourage you, like the wise men, to ask questions, to find out more about who Jesus is. By emphasising this phrase, the King of the Jews, Matthew is pointing us to the one other time that he uses the same name. And that's at Jesus' death. Because Jesus is more than any other earthly king. He is triumphant in glory. Pontius Pilate charges Jesus as the king of the Jews and this description is then placed over his cross. This is quite ironic because his condemnation is in fact correct. Jesus is the king of the Jews, the long awaited king to restore God's people, to redeem Israel. It was supposed to mock Jesus and his followers as he died, but the story does not end there. And we know that Jesus was raised to life, rose from the grave three days later and ascended on high. And in this victory on the cross, Jesus is still crowned king. His kingdom will never end, nor even death can defeat him. How do we recognise Jesus as king in our lives? The second title that Jesus is described as is Messiah. And it's actually Herod who calls him this. We see in verse four, when he had called together all the chief priests and teachers of the law, he, that is Herod, asked them where the Messiah was to be born. Now, what does Messiah mean? Well, in church, we often talk about the Messiah as the saviour of the Israelite people, bringing them back into um, a new covenant with God. In this passage that even Herod, who later tries to kill Jesus, talks about him as though he's the Messiah. Quoting Micah 5 verse 2, priests and scribes understood that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. The actual meaning of Messiah is anointed one. Anointing refers to presence, the presence of God. And this term, Christ or Messiah, means the one who will bring the presence of God to the people of God. We see throughout the Old Testament, people are anointed as priests to intercede for the people, bringing them closer to God in worship, as prophets declaring God's word, and as kings, as we've already discussed, to rule over God's people. All these priests, prophets and kings, they were all anointed, but they weren't the anointed one. Jesus is the anointed one, the Messiah, the perfect priest, prophet and king. Often we make the mistake of stopping there, saying we know Jesus, know he's the anointed one. And we think, well, that, you've got it. But the beauty of this is that we are also anointed. As Jesus has given us God's presence with us, everything Jesus did, he still does today through the church. So we read that Jesus revealed God to these wise men. In the church today, it's our job to reveal God to the world, to point people in the direction of Jesus and into relationship with him. We share in the anointing of Jesus. Could there be anything greater than that? The clues in the title, Jesus Christ, Christ Christos, anointed one. But what are we anointed with? The oil symbolised God's presence in the Old Testament, on, in the Old Covenant. But in this new covenant, we don't just have a symbol. We have the real thing. We have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is quite simply the presence of God. The gift of frankincense points towards Jesus' identity as Messiah, as anointed one, because frankincense is an oil 
and is an oil that was used in anointing. Oil is used throughout the Old Testament to anoint. There are so many stories in the Bible of God providing oil overflowing. This is a physical sign of a spiritual blessing. The blessing of the presence of God. The blessing we too are called to witness to and to bring to others around us. How can you bless someone and be a light for the presence of God in this season between Christmas and New Year? So we've seen in verse 2 that Jesus is King of the Jews. And we've seen in verse 4 um, that he's described as the Messiah. Both names of epic um, greatness. So what's the final name that Jesus is given? It's a much simpler Title. It's the repeated phrase, the young child, which is used when the wise men finally meet Jesus. Because when they meet Jesus, even though he is king of the Jews, even though he is Messiah, they meet him when he's a young child. This is the beauty of Christmas, that God came down to earth to dwell with us. That the fullness of God became the fullness of man. Can you imagine the scene? Three wise men, honourable and learned, falling at the feet of a, a toddler, one or two year old, <laughs> presenting him with gifts that he had no idea how to use. This description of Jesus as a young child reminds us that Jesus became human. It points towards the miracle of the incarnation. As the carol says, God as man with man to dwell. Jesus, our Emmanuel. Jesus experienced all that it is to be human and that should comfort us. That God's not distant, he's not far away, but he's with us and he has experienced all um, that it is to be on earth and human. Jesus is fully God and fully human. He's not one or the other. His humanity is not diminishing of his divinity and his divinity is not diminishing of his humanity. As we can see, the wise men were in awe in worship and yet still refer to him as the young child. In the presence of Jesus, they meet both man and God. Which gift corresponds with this idea of Jesus as a young child, as human? Well, the final gift that we have left is myrrh. But myrrh seems the most inappropriate gift to give a young child. Myrrh is used to cover the smell of death in burial clothes. So giving it to a one-year-old, a two-year-old, that's really strange. Jesus describing him as a child shows that Jesus shares in our experience of humanity and of life and of childhood. Um, so the myrrh reminds us that he shares in our suffering and experienced even death. But we know that his death was not the end. For Jesus triumphed over death and was raised to life and ascended on high. Jesus is truly God with us, Emmanuel, forever. This passage shows us um, who Jesus is and has these three different names for him. King of the Jews, which links with the God, the royalty and sovereignty. Messiah, which links with the frankincense, the oil of anointing, the bringing of God's presence. And then we've got young child, which links with myrrh, with the humanity of Jesus. Look at these three different aspects of his identity, his royalty, his divinity, his humanity. But how do we respond to who Jesus is? So what are you going to do this new year to adore Jesus? We can learn from the wisdom of these wise men. They were not satisfied with looking at the star and admiring it from afar. They did something about this sign from God. They set out and followed it. Maybe you know that God is calling you to seek him, to open up your Bible afresh, to set out to find out more about who Jesus is. These wise men were also not discouraged they weren't put off by influential people like Herod. There's a great quote from Leonard Ravenhill, a Christian evangelist, who um, said, a man who is intimate with God is not intimidated by man. 
We see that when the wise men have actually finally met Jesus and are intimate with God, they are not intimidated by Herod and they don't return to him and give him the information that he seeks. And finally, the wise men rejoiced at the star and entered to worship him. They sense this urgency to worship him now, to be filled with joy and not wait until later. When they worshipped, they didn't come empty handed, but came with adoration. So what are you going to offer in worship to Jesus this coming year? I'd encourage you this coming week to write a New Year's resolution for how you are, like the wise men, going to seek Jesus in 2021.